A sunny, quiet Saturday in rural Georgia. A silver gyroplane is gliding low toward an open pasture, engine silent, the pilot lining up what looks like a perfect emergency landing. But then, snap. A power line slices through the sky, the aircraft pitches violently forward, and in seconds, it's over. The pilot? A 75-year-old man who built this aircraft himself. And here's the thing. This wasn't some freak, unpredictable accident. No, this was a chain of small, painfully simple mistakes that anyone could make. Here's why. Larry Franklin Price Sr. wasn't just some hobbyist messing around on a Saturday. Born in Miami in 1947, he'd spent decades with a love for aviation. He lived in Gainesville, Georgia, and in 2021, he finished something many only dream about, building his own gyroplane. This was a Silverlight Aviation AR-1 registration November 47 Alfa Romeo, an experimental amateur-built aircraft. That means it wasn't mass-produced by a big manufacturer. It was assembled piece by piece by Larry himself and inspected just enough to get it legally in the air. Now, there's a certain pride in flying something you've built with your own hands. You know every bolt, every hose, every little sound the engine makes. But here's the other side of that coin. There's no corporate engineering team making sure every part meets an exact safety standard. No standardized maintenance procedures you can just follow to the letter. In experimental aviation, the pilot is also the final quality control department, and that's a huge responsibility. Larry had recently gotten back into flying after taking some time off. And let me tell you, coming back after a break in flying is dangerous, in a way that's easy to underestimate. Your mind thinks it remembers every checklist and procedure, but habits fade. Little things slip through the cracks. And in aviation, little things can kill you. The NTSB's investigation found something that honestly makes my blood boil. It's so basic, so preventable, it's almost painful to say. When investigators drained the gyroplane's fuel tank, the fuel wasn't a clear golden color like it should be. It was light green with visible layers of water sitting in it. Not just a trace, significant contamination. If you're not a pilot, here's why that's a nightmare. Water doesn't burn. When it gets into your fuel system, it will sink to the bottom of the tank because it's heavier than gasoline. And once that water reaches the engine, it's like trying to run a car on soup. It sputters, surges, and then dies completely. The engine tests after the crash told the whole story. When they ran it with that contaminated fuel and kept it agitated, basically shaking it around, it ran fine for a while. But as soon as the water and fuel naturally separated, the engine coughed, lost power, and died. That's exactly what Larry's onboard video captured. Engine noise turning into surging, then silence. And here's the extremely frustrating part. There's a dead simple way to avoid this. Every pilot is supposed to sump their tanks before flight. That means draining a little fuel from the bottom of the tank into a clear cup to check for water or dirt. Takes two minutes. Larry didn't do it, or didn't do it thoroughly enough, and that was the one thing that sealed his fate before he even took off. Now, you might be wondering... How does water even get in there? Plenty of ways. Condensation from humid air overnight, fuel stored too long in a tank, or simply getting a bad load from a gas pump or container. And here's where it gets crazy. Experimental aircraft like Larry's are often more vulnerable to this than certified planes because their fuel systems can be more, let's say, individualized. No two home builds are exactly alike. And that means maintenance and inspection are only as good as the pilot's own diligence. So right here, before we even get to the crash itself, the chain of events was already locked in. The contaminated fuel was the ticking time bomb. The real question is, could Larry have pulled it off once the engine died? Well, almost. Once the engine quit, Larry actually did something right. He kept his head. The onboard video shows him picking an open field and setting up for a controlled descent. That's exactly the first step any emergency landing checklist will tell you. Aviate first, navigate second, communicate third. He was flying the aircraft all the way down, keeping it under control. That tells me he wasn't panicking. 
and he still had enough presence of mind to try and save it. But here's where reality smacked into theory. The open field wasn't flat. It was sloping upward. Now, if you're not a pilot, you might think, so what? It's still open. The problem is, in aviation, slope changes everything. An upsloping field is like running uphill after you've just sprinted. Your momentum burns off way faster than you expect. It shortens the ground roll, increases the stall risk at the flare, and in an engine out, you have zero extra power to play with. You can't gun it to compensate, and that wasn't the only trap. Right across his final approach, about 50 feet up, stretched a single set of power lines. Thin, dark cables blending into the background, exactly the kind of hazard that kills low-flying pilots every year. In bright daylight, at a shallow angle, those wires can be practically invisible until you're almost on top of them. I've said this before, and I'll keep saying it. Once you've picked your landing spot, the job isn't done. You have to force yourself to scan for secondary hazards, Wires, fences, ditches, tree stumps. It's really crazy how often pilots nail the big part, finding a field, and then lose everything to a small detail they didn't see in time. When Larry's rotor hit that wire, the outcome was sealed. Gyroplanes don't have the mass or momentum to punch through like some heavier aircraft might. The wire stopped the rotor instantly, pitched the nose straight down, and from that low height, there's no recovery. Physics simply won't give you a second chance. Now here's something most non-pilots don't realize. A home-built gyroplane like Larry's AR-1 doesn't behave exactly like the airplanes most people picture when they think emergency landing. First off, certified airplanes, your Cessnas, your Beechcraft, are built to a strict standard. Engineers test every variation. Pilots train in simulators that replicate the exact performance numbers. If something fails, you have a well-documented playbook to fall back on. Experimental aircraft? Totally different ball game. Each build is unique because each builder makes small choices. How to route a fuel line, where to mount an instrument, even what kind of seat cushions to use, and those tiny variations can add up to big differences in how the machine behaves. Gyroplanes have their own quirks, too. They don't stall like fixed-wing airplanes, but they also don't glide as far. If you lose an engine, your circle of options for landing is smaller. You need to keep the rotor spinning with forward airspeed, and in a steep descent, that big rotor disc can block part of your forward view, exactly the direction you need to be watching for hazards. And let's be blunt, when you're flying something you built yourself, you are the test pilot, the mechanic, and the final safety inspector. No factory rep is going to call you up and say, Hey, we've identified a flaw. Bring it in for service. The FAA oversight is minimal here. You're expected to be your own watchdog, which is why it blows my mind when some home-built owners adopt lower safety standards than certified aircraft pilots. If anything, you should be more obsessive. You're betting your life on your own workmanship and diligence. So what's the takeaway from all this? Let's strip it down to the three big lessons that could save your life. Lesson one, the technical. Sump your fuel every single time. Before you taxi, before you even think about takeoff, and not just after you've fueled up, do it after the plane's been sitting, after weather changes, after any period where condensation might form. This is one of those small habits that will prevent the exact kind of failure Larry faced. Lesson two, the tactical. In an emergency, don't just pick the big obvious landing spot and lock in. The moment you commit to a field, sweep your eyes across the approach path. Look for wires, poles, fences, drainage ditches, slope changes. Secondary hazards are sneaky. They hide until it's too late. Build the habit of hunting for them the moment you think, I'm going to land there. Lesson 3. The Human Factor Coming back to flying after a break, especially in an aircraft you built yourself, requires a little humility. Slow everything down. Use written checklists, not just mental ones. If you haven't done a full emergency drill in months or years, grab an instructor for an hour and knock the rust off. Complacency is the invisible killer here. It convinces you that I've done this a hundred times is the same thing as I'm sharp enough to do it today. And here's the truth. Nobody likes to say out loud. 
Larry's crash wasn't unpredictable. It wasn't just bad luck. It was the final link in a chain of preventable events. Water in the fuel, a sloping field, an unseen wire. Break any one of those links and he might have walked away. That's why we talk about these accidents. Not to assign blame, but to make sure the next pilot never finds themselves in the same chain. If you fly, whether it's a home-built gyroplane or a certified Cessna, don't just watch accidents like this and move on. Learn from them. Break the chain before it breaks you. And if you found this breakdown useful, hit that like button, share it with another pilot, and stick around. Because the next lesson might just save your life.